بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله احد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا ايها الكافرون لا the compassionate all praises to Allah the creator of the universes and their sustainer the provider of believers and unbelievers and may his choicest blessings be on the seal of his prophets the last of his messengers and his holy progeny and in particular may his special blessings be on the immediate successor to the holy prophet on Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salam Well, at our last sitting we reached the stage at which we considered the inauguration of Imam Ali alayhi salam as the Khalif on the protests of the people themselves. This, as we saw, he declares very clearly in Shaq Shaqiyya and in various other sermons in Nahjul Balala. But immediately he assumes office. To one's astonishment, the first thing that happens is that Talha and Zubair visit him on an official mission and say to him that revenge should be taken on the murderers of Uthman and they should be brought to justice. So one can see that fitna, dissension was immediately right. Imam Ali alayhi salam of course always knew that that problem was going to arise and hence you will recall that even when the question of allegiance arose Imam Ali alayhi salam refused to take allegiance until Talha and Zubair were called into the court in Masjid the Nabawi and they made their allegiance first and Imam Ali alayhi salam you will recall asked them if they were interested in taking the Khilafah in which case Imam Ali alayhi salam would step down and they could take over he acting as the advisor. They both declined and it is in public place that they made their oath of allegiance. Now they are coming to say to Imam Ali alayhi salam they want justice done to those who murdered Uthman. Imam Ali alayhi salam made three points and this is well reported even in Ibn Athir. Imam Ali alayhi salam said firstly the murder of Uthman is not a straightforward issue of one individual murdering another. There were complex sets of circumstances in which there were different parties who were involved. And in those different parties, there were different opinions. Until today, there are different opinions on the issue. So it is not possible to pinpoint in situations like that. Secondly, he said that the question of Osman's murder was, in, was interwoven with dissatisfaction of people from various regions, at least four different regions. So it will not be easy to ascertain truth in, cert, in such circumstances. And all this was brought in by the devil. 
the devil created the situation, he perpetuated it. And Imam Ali alayhi salam's golden words, once the devil enters on a ground, he does not leave that ground easily. He conquers it and, seek, and, and seeks to monopolize it and perpetuate his stay on that ground. Hence the lesson we take straight away. Because history, particularly of our Aima alayhi salam, is to us a narration of lessons. There is a lot of space inside if you want to be more comfortable here. A, a, a narration of lessons for us to, 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 to learn from all the time. That such steps should not be taken as invites the devil. Or once we discern fitna, it must be scorched as soon as possible. Because once the devil takes ground, he is not going to leave the place easily. But having set out that political scenario, Imam Ali salam makes a second point. He says, but having said all that and the difficulties involved, I have already taken action. And you can see Ali at his judicial climax to see justice done. He says, I have already taken action. So Talha and Zubair are now perplexed and says, Ya Ali, what action have you taken? He says, I have called two important witnesses, two people who certainly witnessed everything that proceeded. Firstly, I called Marwan bin Hakam. Marwan bin Hakam was the secretary of uh, Uthman, and he was there indeed in the first attack. I think I went quickly over this, although I'm going quickly over the situation even tonight, so that we finish in good time, and I do wish to cover Jamal, uh, if possible, tonight, so that we can go on to Sifin tomorrow night and come into discussing after that the, the, the personality and character and teachings of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Well, he says one person who knew was Marwan because on the first attack when they entered, Marwan was the first person they met in the secretary's office before they come to the Khalif. And there they attacked Marwan first. Marwan just survived it. The insurgents thought they had already killed him and he was gone. He survived and then escaped hid himself from them on the second night or so. So he was one person who was there. And secondly, Nala, the wife of Uthman. Because when even the murderers entered the room of, uh, of Uthman, Nala went in to save her husband. In fact, her fingers were all chopped off. So she was an eyewitness to the entire scenario. Imam Ali alayhi salam says in these circumstances, aware of that fact, I have already summoned both of them to take statements from them to ensure that justice is done. Marwan bin Hakam is not forthcoming at all. He is not prepared to cooperate in the investigations of the murder of Uthman at all. So there is nothing I can do about that. Nala did turn up, but she says that she is not able to assist because two people who are involved in the murder, she neither knows their name nor is she able to identify them or describe them. So Imam Ali alayhi salam says, in these circumstances, how do I advance with this investigation? But, he says, you tell me what I should do. Do you have other proposals on investigation? Do you have other steps in mind that should legitimately be taken? And they both said, no, we have no steps in What could they have said? We have no steps in mind at all. The entire meeting was a machination to create trouble. It was not made in good faith. Talha himself was involved in the murder of Osman. If there was anybody involved very clearly, it was Talha. And you remember that I mentioned that on one occasion, Osman went onto the, onto the balcony and specifically, specifically asked for three people. He asked if first Talha was there. And when Talha replied that yes, I am there, he rebuked Talha saying, Talha, I presented a salutation. Why didn't you reply? Because it is obligatory to reply a Muslim, particularly if he is a Khalif and you recognize him as a Khalif, you've got to reply to his salutation. Alaikum salam is obligatory. So that Talha was involved with the insurgents 
is historically beyond question. And all historians have reported that. Muslim and non-Muslim. The second person he asked for was Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr. And he too replied. The third person he asked for was Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. He too replied. So all of them were there. Involved in the insurgency to murder Uthman. Now they are going to Imam Ali salam, to seek for justice. Maybe they should be confessing. And maybe they should be the first people to stand trial. However, Imam Ali says, you tell me what should be done. They said, no, we, we do not have any, any proposals in mind. And uh, we, 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 we prepared therefore to rest matters at that. Imam Ali salam, said, well, you go back. And if you can find any information that will help in the investigation, the file is open. You can come back and we can proceed further. But thirdly, Imam Ali alayhi salam said that I have written to various provinces on this matter and I have kept the issue alive. I am seeking intelligence and if intelligence comes, again, the matter will proceed so that the divine law is fulfilled. Fantastic words of Imam Ali alayhi salam. He is unconcerned, in other words, as to the political machinations. He is unconcerned as to what the political consequences will be. What he is concerned with is that the divine law should be fulfilled. If there was wrong, in the eyes of Allah, the representative of Allah on earth has a duty to see that injustice, if there was an injustice, remedy. And that was his main concern. He says, I have kept this matter open so that the divine law is fulfilled. Talha and Zubair leave the place. Imam Ali alayhi salam immediately embarks on reforms. It is on 18th of Zil Hajjah that Uthman was murdered. But before I go to that, can I make one short brief point? The murderers of Uthman are very well known in history today. I cited Tabari to you the other day in which the names were there. Who was the first to go, including Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr? Who was the second to go? Who was the, who was the first to go on the first day? Who was the first to go on the second day? Who indeed entered the room? Who murdered? And how, he, how Uthman kept the Quran in between and said this is the first person to cross the Quran to, 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 to murder. Though their names are given in history today. So there is no question of... Uh, of uh, anybody accusing Imam Ali salam, of the murder. Indeed, the names of the murderers are known. The names of the insurgents who came from different areas are known because Uthman wrote that letter, you remember, which was found by the insurgents telling the governors whom to arrest and to lock up. The problem with Imam Ali salam, was that witnesses were not forthcoming to prove that case. Nobody was prepared to come forward to say it was Mr. X or Mr. Y as close and concerned a witness as the wife of Uthman was not prepared to come forth as a witness. And Imam alayhi salam left it open. Hence you see the relevance of his writing to all the provinces. But his immediate concern was that there was dissatisfaction in all these provinces of which he was aware because to assist Uthman, he went and saw all the rebels. And when he went and saw all the rebels, he met them. And knew what the dissatisfaction were. Indeed, I said there was a catalog of 17 dissatisfactions against Uthman, one or two of which concerned the governors. So Imam Ali alayhi salam decided he must change the governors. Indeed, he changed nine governors at a go. On 18th of Zil Hajjah, Uthman is murdered on 22nd of Zil Hajjah, three days later, because for three days nobody was prepared to become a Khalif. You can see proof of reluctance of Imam Ali alayhi salam to become a Khalif. However, on 22nd immediately he takes office, he deals with these things and by Muharram these new governors are dispatched. But by that time, Ibn Abbas comes back to Medina, meets Imam Ali alayhi salam and when Imam Ali alayhi salam tells him, that I'm changing governors and said you will go to Syria to replace Muawiyah Ibn Abbas immediately says no I will not indeed Ali you must not do this you must not replace Muawiyah at all and Imam Ali says why he says Muawiyah 
and by then Muawiyah had been in Syria for about 20 years. He had been a governor appointed by Umar and he says he has amassed a lot of wealth there. He has the army under his control. He bribes all the people who matter and all of them are loyal to him whether they believe him or believe in him or not. They, they, they are prepared to continue their loyalty to him for the worldly benefits that they gain from him. Hence, if you do that, he will accuse you of the murder of Uthman. He will refuse to give you allegiance. Imam Ali salam says that does not arise. He has not made allegiance. But I will seek allegiance from him and if he does not, he must go. Ibn Abbas says, no, you cannot do this. And absolutely inspiring is the reply of Imam Ali salam on that point. Whatever the world historians may say, the reply of Imam Ali salam is, is exceedingly inspiring. He turns around to Ibn Abbas and says, Ibn Abbas, I am responsible for the finances of the Muslims. I am responsible now to ensure that the Sunnah of the Prophet is followed. I am responsible to ensure that what is haram does not happen in the Muslim commonwealth. I am the overall caliph. I know, as you just said, that he is misappropriating funds. I know the Sunnah is not followed. Am I to shut my eyes to all this for political reasons? You can see the, 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 the spirit in which Imam Ali salam undertook the governance of the Islamic jurisdiction. And Ibn Abbas says, but I mentioned to you what appears on the surface. You are taking matters in detail. He says, yes, I am too aware that Muawiyah cannot accept me as a, as, as a Khalif because his line of method of behavior is different from my method of behavior but that cannot make me compromise with him because I am answerable to my Lord what answer do I give to Allah on the day of judgment how do I account for my actions and then follow the golden words in history he says between Muawiyah and me there can only be my sword there can only be my sword there is no other way of dealing with Muawiyah because what he does, I cannot tolerate. What I tell him, he will not accept. If I dismiss him, he will not accept my dismissal. The only answer is to, to, to fight him out. And Imam Ali salam instantly changes all those governors who had been misappropriating funds. One of the complaints against uh, Uthman was that he appointed his relatives and friends as governors in various provinces. And those relatives and friends were pocketing public money orphans and widows were not getting their share. Dissatisfaction was rife for that reason as well. Imam Ali salam could not have allowed people who do not have their, their, their actions rooted in Islamic faith to administer the governance of an Islamic province. And hence he said, I will change. He changed nine people instantly. And the consequences immediately came to be felt. But that was not of importance to Imam Ali alayhi salam. Indeed, on one occasion, Ibn Abbas, this is on the way to Jamal, to Basra, for this, for this battle of Jamal, Ibn Abbas enters the tent of Imam Ali alayhi salam. This is when they were camping on the way at Dhuqar, waiting for more troops to arrive. He enters the tent of, uh, of uh, Mawla Ali alayhi salam and says and sees Imam Ali alayhi salam repairing his sandals. So Ibn Abbas asks a question relating to the troops. Imam Ali alayhi salam is busy with his sandal, repairing his sandal. So Ibn Abbas says, Mawla, this is a, a matter of importance compared to your sandals. How dare one say that? But he did. Imam Ali doesn't reply. When he finishes repairing his sandals, he keeps one next to the other and says, Ibn Abbas, I have heard your last comment. How do you value these sandals of mine? So Ibn Abbas says, they have no value. So Imam Ali says, 
you can't say they have no value. One dirham. And Ibn Abbas says, well, in that way, a little more than that, how much would those sandals cost? Imam Ali alayhi salam says, these sandals of that value are more valuable and important to me than your khilafah. If I administer it, I administer it only because my office as Hujjatullah requires me to assume those responsibilities when there was nobody to take over. If I did not, there would be dissension, Muslims would be killed, maybe non-Muslims would, would take over, Islam was in danger and that was the only reason why I took over. Otherwise, it's the position that I hold to me has less value than these my precious sandals. That is how Imam Ali alayhi salam regarded the situation, his answerability. And, and inshallah when we discuss that letter that he wrote to Malik Ashtar, this will become even clearer in, the, in his implementation of the form of government. The governor who was sent to Yemen, Ubaidullah ibn Abbas, when he re re reaches Yemen, he is told that the ex-governor has left. That governor only coming to know that Imam Ali has sent another governor leaves on his own accord. And why does he do that? He leaves with 60,000 dinars short in public treasury. And history report, records that those 60,000 dinars were handed over by him to Aisha in Makkah. We shall soon see for what purpose. In addition to those 60,000 dinars, he took away 600 camels and 600 camels were handed over likewise to Aisha in Makkah. That was the fate, but he takes over the treasury and commences administration as, uh, as uh, the governor of Yemen. Likewise, the governor of uh, Egypt, he also left, but he left having taken with him a large sum uh, of money from the public treasury. And, uh, and uh, Likewise, a number of other governors left doing exactly that, having done all, all, exactly that. Because they knew that whatever they could make under Uthman, they did. Under Ali salam, there is now no chance of making money to profit themselves. And hence, one finds that they decided that whatever they can reap at that occasion was their booty. That shows the level to which Muslims had dropped. But these were not Muslims who became Muslims voluntarily. Most of them were relatives of Uthman who became Muslims at the conquest of Makkah. They had no choice. They felt that rather than remain as non-Muslims under a Muslim government, they may as well accept Islam. Two governors were not able, however, to enter their places. The governor assigned to Kufa, Ammar, came back saying that at, at Tabuk I was stopped by a group of people telling me what is happening in, in uh, Kufa. Abu Musa Ash'ari, who was the governor appointed by Uthman, would not budge and there was going to be a, a, a battle. He was not going to yield to me and I would not be able to take over the governance. The second person who could not enter was the governor assigned to Syria because he was met by a deputation on the way saying Muawiyah will not, will not accept. So Imam Ali salam immediately embarked on putting that situation right. And he said he would deal with Muawiyah first because insofar as Muawiyah was concerned, the path was clear for Imam Ali salam. He could not allow a devil who was a devil in his eyes to perpetuate the plunder of Muslim funds. He wrote a letter to Muawiyah straight away, saying the first thing I demand from you is allegiance. Are you making allegiance to me or not? Secondly, hand over the governorship of Syria. Indeed, the situation by then in Syria was complicated. Because although Omar in his days supervised uh, Muawiyah, even in those days Muawiyah was acting independently. There was a lot of wealth he could amass for himself, a lot of influence he could, he, he could exert himself, a lot of people whom he personally appointed. So he had all the right people in his place. And Omar was acting with Muawiyah politically.
so he was gaining strength but under Uthman then he was an Umayyad he almost was acting independently as though he was not a governor of the Khalif at all do you remember that uh, advice that Imam Ali salam, went and gave to Uthman that this satisfaction is because you are leaving such a lax and unsupervised hand to the, to the governors in various provinces Muawiyah receives this emissary of uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam, but he is shown various things. He is shown that in the mosque in, in uh, Damascus, there is the shirt of Uthman with blood of Uthman hanging on the pulpit. So that people see that shirt and their anger is evoked to take revenge against the murderers of Uthman. And since when did they love Uthman? Indeed. When Ithman was, uh, was besieged by the, by the various people from various quarters, including people from Syria, Uthman wrote to Muawiyah saying, I am in this state, I expect help from you. So send an army over from, from uh, Syria to assist me in these circumstances. Uthman was entitled to that help from Muawiyah. Not one person was sent. The letter was totally ignored. To his murder, Uthman received not a scintilla of assistance from Muawiyah. He was totally ignored. And indeed, insurgents from Syria were also instigating the murder of Uthman. So where is the question of Syrians being provoked by the death of Uthman? And indeed, the fingers of Naila were also exhibited to the people in Syria. This is what the emissary of Imam Ali saw. So he was shown 60,000 people ready to go out and fight for the, for the revenge to avenge the blood of Uthman. When he comes back, he brings a response from Muawiyah. And uh, the messenger of Muawiyah carries that response on a, on, 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 a, on a placard so that everybody sees there is a response. Imam Ali salam opens the response publicly because he has nothing to hide. It's a public affair. And when he opens, the letter is totally empty. Blank piece of paper which meant in other words that Muawiyah has no reply to send in other words he's not making allegiance he's not giving up the governorship he's doing nothing but he dared not write a single word just sent a blank piece of paper everybody was enraged and they wanted to mal handle the, 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 the emissary of Muawiyah Imam Ali -Salam immediately stopped them said no we will not mal handle him he is an emissary, we will deal with him politely. We will give him all the diplomatic uh, uh, accretions that he is entitled to. We will provide him diplomatic immunity because that is what the international law of Islam demands. And he was treated well, but he was asked, what is the situation? Why this? He says, O oh Ali, seeing that you are giving me diplomatic immunity, I want to tell you the truth, but give me an assurance that this immunity will be extended to me throughout. And Imam Ali alayhi salam says, yes, tell us the truth, you will go unharmed. And he repeats all that. Imam Ali alayhi salam immediately makes a khutbah and says, we must amass ourselves and we must uh, march on Syria. So the march to Syria was to start. Indeed, indeed. The point I always try and make is that it is not Muawiyah who attacked Imam Ali. Muawiyah caused Imam Ali to attack him. He created the fitna, he created the disobedience. Either it was a question of accepting that situ situation in which a, a, a governor was creating a UDI, a, a unilateral declaration of independence, or it was bringing Syria within the administration of Islam. Now, to bring Syria under the administration of Islam was wajib, was obligatory on Imam Ali alayhi salam when he knew that Muawiyah was not conducting the affairs of the Muslims in accordance with the holy book and the sunnah of the Prophet. It was impossible for him to shut his eyes in those circumstances. But before an army could be gathered to proceed to, to, to Syria, another situation arises. Whilst the governors were being changed, Talha and Zubair go back to Imam Ali salam. Talha asks to be appointed the governor of Kufa. Zubair asks to be appointed the, the governor of Basra or, 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 or vice versa. It was vice versa actually. And Imam Ali salam, of course could not trust them to appoint them as governors. 
he would be creating a new problem for himself. He gave them a very polite reply. He says, you are people whose allegiance I sought first. You are my counselors in Medina and I will not be prepared to part from you and keep you at such a distance. I would like you to remain in Medina so that I can have your counsel if I need your counsel at any time. So they could not move out. But, but another development takes place in the meantime. Aisha, who as you know left Medina during all the trouble in uh, Makkah, in, in Medina for the murder of Uthman, she was the person who instigated the, the insurgents. She encouraged them. Indeed, when the first delegation came to whom Imam Ali salam, spoke, she went and told them that they should continue with, the, with, 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 their, with, with their rebellion. They were heartened. They took heart by the fact that the mother of the faithful, the widow of the Holy Prophet was supporting them. When they came again, again she addressed them. Marwan bin Hakam went to Aisha, particularly when water was not forthcoming, and said, look, even water is not in the, in the uh, palace of Uthman, if I may so call it. And she says, may Allah kill Uthman for all that he has done. And indeed, on one occasion, clearly reported in Tabari also, when she addressed the rebellion, she said, kill that Na'fal. Na'fal was a Jew in Egypt. And because Uthman resembled that Jewish monk, he was a, a, a rabbi because of his beard, etc. Uthman had a nickname. Those who hated him called him by that name. And that is the name by which Aisha called him publicly. There was no question but that she instigated, the, and all historians say that. Now seeing that she would be involved, because Umm Habiba, who was uh, uh, a daughter of Abu Sufyan, went to speak to insurgents to give water to Uthman and was ill-treated. Aisha took that as an excuse and said, if Umm Habiba was ill-treated, I do not want to be here. And she thought it was better that she moved out to Makkah. When she heard that Uthman has been murdered, she was returning now from Makkah back to Medina. On the way she gets the information from her informer that Ali has been inaugurated as the Khalif. That Aisha could not stomach. So she immediately said, we must avenge the death of uh, Uthman. The informer, her informer himself turns to Aisha and says, I am shocked to hear this from you because just recently you were telling the rebels that they should kill Uthman. Now you are talking of avenging the death of Isman, Uthman. And Aisha says, yes. We must arrange the death of Osman. She gets back to Makkah. Now she gets all those wealth that I talked about from all these various provinces. So you can now see the scenario. The mother of the faithful wants to create problems with the, with the, with the Khilafah of Imam Ali alayhi salam. All these governors want to create problems. The people who supported Imam Ali alayhi salam were the common men who had rebelled. Because they wanted Imam Ali alayhi salam and the common man in Medina. But you remember the, 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 the eminent people of Medina withheld their bay'ah. So this group is now meeting in Makkah. Talha and Zubair decided that they too must be there because it would be too late for them otherwise to get the Khilafah themselves. Hence, they had to move out of Medina. They did not have the authority of Imam Ali alayhi salam to do so. Because he said he wanted them in Medina. Now they approach Imam Ali alayhi salam and say that, O oh Ali, we want to go to Makkah to perform an Umrah. Knowing too well that that is one request, Imam Ali alayhi salam can never refuse. Because it's a question of performing an Umrah. How do you stop someone performing an act like that? One can see that the religious dutifulness of a pious person was being abused purely to serve self-interest. Imam Ali alayhi salam said, well, if you want to go to Makkah for Umrah, I cannot come in your way, but I want to give you one very strong reminder, and that is this, that before I accepted to become Khalif, 
Didn't I ask both of you if you wanted to become Khalifs? And they said, yes. A fact they couldn't deny. Didn't you both decline that position? And didn't you both ask me to become the Khalif? They said, yes. And Imam Ali said, before I accepted anybody else's bay'ah, didn't I call for you? And didn't you both make bay'ah to me? And they accepted. And Imam Ali said, didn't you make this bay'ah voluntarily? And they accepted. Imam Ali salam knew who he was dealing with. It was not important for him to take these things in writing. He was only clearing himself vis-a-vis -vis his Lord. That vis-a-vis -vis Allah, he is in the clear. He says, well, remember that oath that you gave to me. Remember that bayah and go to Makkah for Umrah. And they left. And the moment they left, the plot was hatched that there should be a, a, a rebellion against Imam Ali salam, alleging that Imam Ali salam, had a hand in the murder of Uthman. In fact, and it's a strange world, in fact, the emissary of Muawiyah when he came to Medina was asked this publicly by Imam Ali salam. He says, has Muawiyah given any reason for not making bayah to me? For not accepting my khilafah, he says yes. He, he he implicates you in the murder of his Uthman. And Imam Ali publicly in, in the masjid says, implicating me in the murder of Uthman. Well, I am not involved in the murder of Uthman in one bit. And people in Medina are here who will vouch for it. And the people in Medina did vouch for it. This is significant because of what happens next. When this was being hatched, and all the money accumulated and animals and, and, and armaments accumulated then the question is how do they proceed from there one uh, uh, Aisha's idea was attack Medina despite the fact that it was the the, 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 the stronghold the capital of the Holy Prophet himself she says attack Medina and the people don't say what I am saying. They said, no, but we can't attack Medina because people of Medina are in favor of Imam Ali. We will not easily succeed. Hence, it was suggested that they go to Damascus, join hands with Muawiyah, and then carry forward. And people said, Muawiyah will not accept because Muawiyah wants power. He will not accept anybody else interfering with him. He not only wants the last word, he wants the only word. The only word must be his. And everybody must, be, must obey him. We will be at a disadvantage. And so they decide that, that uh, Syria is not the correct place to go to and decide that the attack should be made in Basra. I have not been able to understand the logic of it. Attack Basra, I suppose take over Basra. To what, to what gain? The blood of Uthman was not going to be avenged in that way. It was merely to pull Imam Ali salam into a battle with him. And that was all. That must be the only thing. Another interesting incident takes place at that time. Aisha decided that she should not be the only widow of the Holy Prophet who should be involved in this. So she spoke to Hafsa, the daughter of uh, Umar. And Hafsa at first agreed to join her. Indeed, Hafsa was already with her in Makkah. But Abdullah bin Umar, the son of Umar, decided when he was in Medina that he will not join either party. He knew what was going on and he decided that it was best to keep out of it all. Not join Ali at all and not join the people who wanted to avenge the blood of uh, Osman. He of course was in Medina when all this happened and knew the truth of the matter. So when he left for Makkah, again to perform an Umrah, he met his sister Hafsa and advised her to keep out of it. And so Hafsa kept out of it. Aisha now meets Umm Salma who also happened to be in Makkah and says, you join me. And Umm Salma says, Aisha, not only do I swear that I will never join you and I will never fight against uh, Ali, I advise you not to do so. And Aisha says, why? She says, because I have heard the Holy Prophet say, and you have heard him say, that he who disobeys Ali disobeys me. And we have covered these uh, sayings of the Holy Prophet many times. I will not detain you on it. 
And hence, I do not want to be guilty of it. Advise you not to be guilty of it. But, the other thing I want to remind you is this. That have you forgotten the day when the Holy Prophet was with us, was very distressed, and uh, announced, if only I knew that my wife would do this. So we asked him, what have you learned about us? What have you learned that we would do? That you are lamenting in this way. And he says, one of my wives after me will join rebels. She will become uh, head of a rebellion. And the dogs of Hawab will be seen barking at her. Alas, that this should never happen. But alas, it will happen. And Umm Salma says, Aisha, what is this now other than a rebellion? You are a widow of the Prophet. Aren't the words of the Holy Prophet now coming through, through you? Aisha says, yes, he did say that. And I cannot accept this situation. And indeed, if we go to Basra, we might pass through Hawab. So she decides dogmatically that she is not joining. She tells Talha and Zubair that I have nothing to do with this. Talha was married to Aisha's younger sister and was a cousin through Abu Bakr. Zubair was also married to Aisha's elder sister. So you can see the affinity. Indeed, Zubair's son Abdullah was adopted by Aisha, was Aisha's son. At the instigation of Abdullah for a number of days and Zubair, ultimately Aisha forgot the story and decided that she would join. So she sets out with, with this army towards Basra. Intelligence of the army having left Makkah reaches Imam Ali alayhi salam. So Imam Ali alayhi salam immediately calls a meeting, calls the people in the court in Medina and explains them of the information he has received and says now, although we were preparing to attack Damascus, we are not able to do so because there is this other emergency. I cannot see the people in Basra being massacred by this army. I cannot see sedition prevailing within this uh, commonwealth. When I am the Caliph, it is my predominant duty to ensure that law and order is restored in Basra. So it becomes my duty if there is an army to raise an army and go and fight these people. Of course my first aim will be to explain them and bring peace. I do not want one Muslim soul to be lost. And of course if a compromise is possible we will reach compromise with them. But we have got to show that, they, they, that we are able to confront them. You will be surprised that for two consecutive days Imam Ali salam made eloquent speeches in the mosque in Medina. Not one person stood up to say that he was prepared to join him in this battle. So you can see the state of the Madonites at that time. On the third day, about three or four people stood up and said, Ali, we will support you. Because whatever comes, we remember the words of the Holy Prophet. And relying on those words, we will come with you and we will fight with you. And we will see that these insurgents are taken care of. Imam Ali salam leaves Medina with a force of only 900 people. His intelligence was that Aisha had already left with Talha and Zubair with a thousand people from Makkah. 600 on camels. Well, we perhaps know where those 600 camels came from and 400 on horses. So Imam Ali -Islam thought he should have a minimum of that, but however, with 900 he set off. On the way at Zukhara he stops and sends a strong delegation of Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr and Abdullah bin Jafar to Kufa so that an army from Kufa joins them. Musa Ash'ari, Abu Musa Ash'ari, does not allow them to obtain any assistance in Kufa. In fact, Abu Musa makes a speech to the people in Kufa saying, 
this is a battle between companions of the Prophet and you don't need to involve yourselves. So, these two come back. Imam Ali sends another delegation, this time of uh, Ibn Abbas and Malik Ashtar. Ibn Abbas and Malik Ashtar come. They make speeches. People don't, are not moved in Kufa. And then Imam Ali salam sends Ammar Yasir and Imam Hassan salam. They come and Ammar Yasir in the masjid in Kufa stands up and says to Abu Musa that this hadith you are quoting is a complete distortion of what the Holy Prophet said. Now Abar was a companion of the Holy Prophet. What the Holy Prophet did say was addressing people like you. That when people like you stand up, in other words, stand up in dissension, in hypocrisy, in, in fitna, when people like you stand up, it is better that they are asleep than they should be standing up. And if they are awake, it is better that such people should be sitting than standing. And if standing, it is better that they should just be standing than walking. That hadith is directed to people like you. It could never be directed. It could never be directed to ensuring that there is peace and order in an Islamic country. Indeed, the Holy Prophet himself went out on so many occasions. However, Ammar Yasir was able to take over the government house. Imam Hassan salam, made a moving speech in Kufa <coughs> and the people of Kufa turned around to Imam Hassan and said, if Imam Ali finds the situation so important that he sends his son to us in this way and the daughter of Fatima to Zahra salamullahi alayha is here, we will join you. In due course, an army of 10,000 is gathered. Indeed, when Imam Ali salam, proceeded further towards Basra, he had an army of 20,000. Aisha had gathered an army of 30,000 with Talha and Zubair. She was in the center. When Yala, the past governor, the immediate predecessor, governor appointed by Uthman, left Yemen, he also, with the 600 camels, took one special camel called Al-Askar. And that camel was presented to Aisha for her to use personally. So she was on Al-Askar with Talha on the right, Zubair on the left, sometimes Zubair on the right, Talha on the left and moving on. The guide, whenever they, they passed through a desert, would give the name of the desert. When they passed through a valley, he would give the name of the valley. When they passed through, through a village, he would announce the name of the village, customarily. <laughs> when they passed Hawab, he announced, now we are in the valley of Hawab. And when Aisha heard valley of Hawab, she remembered what Umm Salma told her. She remembered the words of the Holy Prophet. So she immediately stopped and called the guide and said, tell me, what did you say was the name of this valley? And the guide says, this is the valley of Hawab. Now, a shrill passes through her body because she becomes convinced that each word of the Holy Prophet comes true. And soon while that happened, dogs surrounded her camel and dogs started barking at her. She now saw each letter of that hadith of the Holy Prophet coming true. So she alights the camel. I am not reciting this to the youths for nothing. You can now see the great significance of youths needing to know this part of history. She comes down and says, I swear I will not go to Basra and report this hadith of, uh, of uh, the Holy Prophet. Talha and Zubair are now worried that if they lose Aisha, an important pivot in their journey would be lost. Hence they start convincing her. They tell her, How, how she can make a penitence for that? She is not convinced. But you will be shocked to hear that to bring her on, Talha and Zubair maneuvered to get 50 witnesses, not one or two, 50 witnesses to come before Aisha and swear that that place was not the valley of Hawab. History records that since introduction of Islam, 
that was the first time that false oaths were publicly administered in that way for a political purpose or for any purpose. But they were patently false oaths. Fifty people gave that oath. Aisha said, I reject the oath of you all. You can all go. I'm not moving from here. So they decided there was only one way to get her moving. For a full night, they rested. Next full day, they rested. Another night passed. Aisha wouldn't stir. Next morning, they started a new campaign. Drums started drumming. Ali is chasing us. Ali is behind, he's chasing us. Immediately Aisha stood up. She started galloping her camel also. And on they went. On they went until they came to Batra. Now, cutting a long story short, they took charge of the governor. They imprisoned the governor and besieged, besieged Basra. Indeed, they entered Basra and took charge, first of all, of the treasury. Because they needed funds. First of all, they took charge of the treasury. In the meantime, Imam Ali Salam's army came over. Now 30,000 with 20,000. And the army of Imam Ali Salam consisted of veterans. They had fought in various battles at all. There was Malik Ashtar there, there was Ammar Yasir, and, uh, and uh, Ammar Yasir was known to have fought with the Holy Prophet and was the general of this particular, of the horses, of the cavalry. However, when the two armies met, at night there were skirmishes. People in the army of Imam Ali trying to explain to the other people that what was happening was wrong. Indeed, the next morning, a person went out from the army of Imam Ali with Quran, saying, in the name of Quran, we must make peace. And Quran does not accept this. One history says Talha, Another, other historians don't specifically name him, say one person from um, the army of Talha chopped off the hand of the person who was carrying the Quran. But as that hand was chopped off, he seized Quran with the second hand. The second hand was chopped off. When the second hand was chopped off, he handled Quran with his, with his neck and held it to his bosom with his chopped off arms now. They ultimately killed him. When Imam Ali salam saw that, he said, first bring his body here and let us pray over him. And once that was done, he said, fine, let us now wait. These are Muslims, we will not attack them. We cannot attack them. Let them attack us first. A barrage of arrows flew. Imam Ali salam said, too soon. When they came forward physically to attack, now not throwing arrows from far, physically coming to attack, Imam Ali salam said, now attack back. And a ferocious war erupted. But before that, I have omitted to say an important thing to you. Before that, that night before, Imam Ali salam had started negotiations with the opposite side. Indeed, he had written a letter, which is in Najul Balagha, a written a letter to Talha, saying, do not get into all this. It is not necessary. Lives of Muslims are involved. If your problem is that I was involved in the murder of Osman, then why don't we appoint an arbitrator, an independent person, independent of you and me, to sit and carry out a trial? Bring your evidence, I'll bring my defense. And I am prepared to follow the decision of that arbitrator on the question of my guilt or innocence. Well, how can it be more fair than that? Talha does not bother to reply that letter. But that night, Imam Ali salam speaks to Zubair and puts forward a lot of things to Zubair. Negotiations were continuing and Imam Ali salam and Zubair says, I'd like to ponder over this. Imam Ali salam says, before you start pondering and leave me, I want to tell you one thing as a matter of my duty. And Zubair says, do. He says, do you remember the times of the Holy Prophet? When the Holy Prophet introduced me, I was with him and he introduced me to you and you said you knew me and the Holy Prophet told you yes of course I know that you know him but I'm not introducing you to just Ali as such I want to introduce him to you as a person I love 
do you love Ali as well? And he says, he says yes. So do you remember you told the Holy Prophet that you love me? And Zubair says, yes, this now comes back to me. And then the Holy Prophet said to you, oh Zubair, you say that to me, but I fear the day when you will amass an army to fight Ali. You will set out on a journey to fight my this brother. And in that process, you will cause a lot of loss of Muslims. You will cause a lot of loss of Muslims themselves apart from their property. And you will cause a lot of loss and grief to my this dear brother. And Zubair says, alas that the day might not come. And the Holy Prophet says, alas, I see Zubair that that day will come. Zubair says, yes. I now remember all this. One wonders why he didn't remember before. He says, yes, Ali, I remember all this. I want to seek your forgiveness. And I want to come out of this. And Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Zubair, if you do truly come out of this, I am prepared to forgive you even now. You can see, you can see the level of forgiveness of this person. Indeed, what wonder that if he had survived, that wound of Ibn Muljam, that he would have forgiven Ibn Muljam also. <coughs> what wonder that he would have done that. <coughs> Indeed, he almost said that in the mosque in Kufa. He offered that situation to, to Zubair so that the hereafter of Zubair is saved. Imam Ali salam's concern throughout was the hereafter of the people. And hence, inshallah, on the last evening of our sitting on Friday night, I hope to discuss what he told us, not the Muslims of his time, what he left behind for you and I as bequests for our salvation in the hereafter. Zubair goes and informs everybody that I will not because Ali has reminded me this and it is true. He was told Ali is making a mistake, he says, but I remember it myself. I remember myself, I was there and the Holy Prophet did say this. Ultimately, pressures by Aisha, pressure by his son Abdullah, he decided to remain in the battlefield, but he wasn't happy about it. A stage is reached in the course of the battle that he sees Ammar Yasir. Ammar Yasir, as the commander of the cavalry, was right in front and he was organizing the horsemen fighting the, bat the, 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 the army of Zubair. Zubair had to be in the forefront, although the standard was being held near the camel of uh, Aisha. But he was there. And when he saw Ammar, another hadith comes to his mind, which we will repeat tomorrow night. Hadith of the Holy Prophet. Ammar was very busy building the new mosque in Medina, Masjid in Nabawi as it is today, being now built by the Holy Prophet himself. The Holy Prophet laying bricks and Ammar every time would come and say, Ya Rasulullah, you will not pick a brick. I will. Holy Prophet says, Ammar, I have to participate in it. And, the whole, and he says to the Holy Prophet, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I will do twice the job. I will do my share and your share. But your sweat must not come into this. Your spiritual contribution is more than we deserve from you. And on one occasion the Holy Prophet turns to Ammar and says, Ammar, your this sweat in building the mosque, may Allah reward you for it. And I can give you the very good news that you will die in a way Allah will be pleased with you. Ammar says, Ya Rasulullah, will I die in a jihad? Will I die a martyr? And the Holy Prophet says, Yes, Ammar, you will die a martyr. And Ammar says, With you, Rasulullah? He says, Alas, not with me, but with my loved one Ali. <coughs> so he says, how come? He says, there will be the Holy Prophet says, there will be a rebellion. The rebels will be out to fight Ali. You will be fighting on the side of justice and truth. That is the side on which Ali will be. And the rebels in that battle will kill you and you will die a martyr. Are all doubts now resolved? And this is a hadith reported. More about it tomorrow. Zubair remembers this hadith on seeing Ammar, 
He says, my Lord, the Holy Prophet said he will be killed by the rebels. We are rebelling. Ali on the other side, exactly what the Holy Prophet said. You can see situation after situation coming in. Zubair could not stand this anymore. Remembering what Ali said the previous night, remembering this, he walked out of the battlefield. He ran away from the battlefield. But, as fate would have it, when he is on his way to Makkah, a group of Arabs who were sitting now to await the result of this battle. The battle is called the battle of Jamal, only because Aisha was on this camel, and Jamal is, is, is the Arabic word for camel. So the battle is called the battle of camel because it was concentrated on that camel on which Aisha was sitting. So the leader of that group says, can somebody get me the tidings from Zubair about the battle of Jamal? One of the persons goes out. Zubair of course suspects him, he befriends him. Time for prayer, they both set out to say their prayers and uh, this man kills Zubair in the course of, of prayers. So Zubair dies his death that way. Talha continues fighting in, in, in the battlefield. The irony of it all is that Marwan bin Hakam sees Talha in this battlefield. Marwan bin Hakam is in the battlefield. If there was any person under the sun who knew who the killers of Osman were, it was Marwan bin Hakam. If there was any person under the sun who knew that Imam Ali salam was totally innocent of the murder of Osman, it was Marwan bin Hakam. Marwan bin Hakam, seeing this on a situation and seeing Talha extolling his people, kill the murderers of Osman, avenge the blood of Osman, became irritated, became furious, tells to his slave, look at this. This is the person himself who was involved in killing Uthman so recently. This is only about four months ago. So recently he was involved in killing of Uthman. Today, for the grandeur of the world, he turns around and accuses these other people of killing the uh, of killing Uthman, and he is himself portraying to be innocent of it. And he lashes out an arrow from his bow so firmly that it goes and strikes Talha. Talha is hit on his foot, but the arrow was so strong, pierced through the leg of Talha into the body of the horse. The horse now is, becomes unstable, rears back, Talha is thrown onto the ground. When he's thrown onto the ground, people come to his assistance. He asks one of them to take him on the back of his horse. He realizes how much he is bleeding. A stage arrives in that battlefield before he is moved out. He asks that he be taken to Basra. Before he is taken to Basra, before he moves out, he realizes he is soon to die. He calls one of the men of Ali who was fighting there. He calls him and says, you are fighting on behalf of Ali. He says, yes, I am fighting on behalf of Ali. I can't fight you. So the other person on the horseback asks him, why can't you fight him? He says he is wounded and the orders of Ali are three. We must bear three things in mind. One, we must never kill a wounded soldier on the other side. These are the instructions of Ali. In this fight we must never kill a wounded person. So I can't touch him. My Mullah has said I mustn't touch him. Secondly, so this man says, what else did he say? He says, secondly, we must never, we must never chase a fleeing fugitive. And you are now fleeing, so I can't even touch you, nor, nor Talha. The orders of Ali prohibit me. Look at the rules of war that Imam Ali salam proclaimed and followed. That is the more important thing. Preaching is easy, but followed and, his, and ensure that his people follow. And thirdly, no plundering at all. No looting of any soldier on the opposite side. And if there was any article that was plundered, it should be brought back and, uh, and, and, and be collected in the mosque in Basra. And that is exactly what happened. So, I can't do anything. Talha said, that is not what I am interested in. I only want to know 
that you are a man of Ali. This reply satisfies me, you are a man of Ali. Can I have your hand? Can you extend your hand? So he says, yes, but what do you want, Talha? I'll extend my hand. And immediately this person belonging to the camp of Ali extends his hand. Talha says, I put my hand in your hand because I cannot reach Ali. Putting my hand in your hand, I hereby make another bay'ah to Ali so that before I die, I die on the bay'ah of Ali. Is truth and falsehood concealed anymore? One runs away from the battlefield in anguish and in guilt. Another dies having just. And when this is said to Imam Ali, Imam Ali feels sorry for him, feels sorry for him, laments and says, Talha, once a friend of mine did not think he would be able to enter heaven without bay'ah from me. How can today, centuries later, people think they will enter heaven without accepting Ali as the Imam? That is a lesson we learn from Talha in, in Jamal. And that is how he died. But Aisha was still there. Standard bearer after standard bearer. They are attacked. Ammar Yasir conducts uh, his, 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 uh, his uh, war there. And it is said about 70 standard bearers were killed. But immediately one is killed at the order of Aisha. Another person moves next to the camel. Imam Ali alayhi salam tells Ammar, Ammar, this battle will never be over. How many Muslims will be killed in this way? So Ammar says, Mawla, what are your orders? He says, kill that animal. Aisha, of course, must not be touched. Kill that animal. Because so long as that animal is standing, people rally round that animal and one standard bearer will come after another kill the animal and you will see the effect and look at what happens Ammar Yasir, it was very difficult because the, am the, the camel was the one that was being protected Ammar Yasir finds a way whereby a passage is found and he goes through that, right through that passage killing anybody stopping him with his own garrison now the people, the soldiers of Talha and Zubair see Ammar as a, as a fighting lion there he finds his way reaches that particular camel and strikes at one of the legs and he thought one leg was sufficient that leg goes down the camel is still standing intact unstirred and balanced Ammar Yasir knocks off another leg yet the camel is standing he becomes bewildered at what's happening Ali himself السلام, moves forward and says, Ammar, do not finish at that. I know you feel there is supernatural power that is keeping this animal standing. Knock the third leg and the story will be over. Ammar Yasir hearing this from Imam Ali, knocks the third leg over and the camel collapses. Immediately the camel collapses. Look at Ali. We are not only discussing history, we are discussing the character of this giant of a man Allah sent on earth and what a gift from God easy to preach in the mosques easy to write theses but to act Islam on the battlefield is what Ali taught us he immediately issues orders to Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr his companion son of Abu Bakr brother of Aisha says Muhammad you are a mahram to Aisha you get in give her a, give her a hand and we will escort her with our soldiers in safety so that Aisha goes unhurt. And so she left unhurt. Once Aisha has left, the camel died, the story was over. Imam Ali alayhi salam immediately announces anything plundered into the mosque in, 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 in Basra. People come to Ali who are saved saying, Ali, we seek your forgiveness. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, just as the Holy Prophet did, I forgive you all and you are all free, you all have amnesty, and you will all continue to remain in Basra, in Makkah, wheresoever you choose, under my, my, my full protection and my full safety. Anybody finding that any property of his is missing, let him go to the mosque in, in, in Basra, pick up his things and take it away unmolested. That was how Imam Ali alayhi salam managed the affair at Jamal. And when all that was settled, he proceeds to the mosque in Basra and delivers a fantastic sermon 
still today preserved in Nahjul Balagha. Forgives them all and then approaches Aisha and approaches Aisha like a forgiving victor. He has already protected her. He had already made sure she left unwounded, unhurt, despite everything that she did. And she say, he says to her, my instructions now are that you proceed to where the Holy Prophet left you. Fantastic words that Imam Ali salam chooses. She was not keen to go to Medina. Malik Ashtar conveys the message. Eventually, Imam Ali salam sends Imam Hassan to deliver a special confidential message. When Aisha receives that confidential message, she immediately stops stressing her hair and agrees to go back to Medina. And she was escorted by an escort of ladies arranged by Imam Ali salam so that they escort her safely to Medina. The sanctity of a lady. This is how the Holy Prophet always lived. And I kept saying this last year when I was talking on the Holy Prophet. How he treated his wife, how he treated ladies, how he kept saying to everybody, treat your ladies in your house well, Allah will treat you well. That was his lesson all through, all through his life. Kept saying that heaven is at the feet of your mothers. He who treats ladies, treats ladies unfairly, Allah will never have mercy on him. He who has treated ladies well, the wrath of Allah will not fall on him. This was the teaching of the Holy Prophet, which you can see Imam Ali salam fulfilling to its, to, to its limit. Little orphans, if they were ladies, were treated differently. And Imam Ali salam's orders were exactly that. The ladies who had come to Badr. Historians say how the Holy Prophet treated those ladies with clemency. Alas! Alas, if the ladies of the family of the Holy Prophet were treated in that way, if only the people in Karbala remembered all this and said, the family of the Prophet, we will treat well, we will not ill treat. After the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, as you have already heard yesterday, the tents were burnt, but keep the ladies in the open. Not only that, even take away the veils from their heads. This is what Ibn Zaynab salam, this is what Imam Zainul Abideen salam complained most about. And then when this day of the 11th of Muharram came, they decided that all these ladies will now be paraded to Kufa, paraded with open faces, paraded and taken there on camels that were barren. Ladies who had never sat on camels before, now are sitting on, on, on barren camels, not knowing how to do it. And when these camels were brought, Bibi Zayyab salam says to the fourth Imam, Oh Ali, I see this particular camel crying. Can we do anything for this for this particular camel? What is she saying to the other camels? And Imam Zainul Abidin says to her aunt, oh my aunt, this camel is crying on our situation. This beast is crying that we have been treating this we are being treated in this way. And he's saying to the other camels, Beware, these are the children of the Holy Prophet. They belong to the Allah base. Treat them well on your backs. Make sure you do not cause them any problems. Make sure you do not go so fast that they are injured. Eventually all of them get onto the camel backs. But even there the torture is not finished. The entire camel is taken through the through the bodies of Ahlul Bayt so that Malayla can see the body of Akbar lying there and so that the widow of Abbas can see the body of Abbas lying there. But when Imam Zayn Abidin passed by the body of Imam Hussein salam, his condition so changed that Bibi Zainab salam, reports, I almost thought this person would collapse at this moment. Quickly I rode next to him, held his hands and said, Ya Ali, what is your position? And all that he says in reply to me is, Oh my, oh my aunt Zainab, what do you expect? Would the condition of that son to me, who sees his father in this condition, without ghusl, without kafan and unburied, and he's not able to give ghusl to his father, and he's not able to bury his father. 
الا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا اي منقلب ينقلبون انا لله وانا اليه راجعون رحم الله من يكره الفاتحه